Well, hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Our topic for today is philosophical progress. Our minds, brains, do we have free will? Is happiness just a state of mind? These are just some of the questions that philosophers have asked since there were philosophers. But has any progress been made on any of these topics? Have philosophers of the day more or less answered the, pa the questions that philosophers of the past have raised? And why does progress in philosophy matter in the first place? Now, to share his thoughts on these questions, we have our dear old friend, Daniel Stoljar, Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Center for Consciousness at the Australian National University. He's also the author of, our, of this book, uh, Philosophical Progress in Defense of a Reasonable Optimism. So hello, Dan. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Uh, hello, JJ. Great to be here. Okay, so before we get into the question about philosophical progress, let's go back to basics and define our target concept, which in this case is the concept of philosophy. So how should we understand philosophy in this context? Well, um, I think of philosophy in this context as a subject matter or a series of topics, not dissimilar to the topics that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, I think of the mind body problem or the free will problem or the problem of induction. I think of these as topics or subject matters that one can investigate and ask questions about. And um, it's, a, it's a little bit open-ended what the collection of the topics are that philosophy is interested in, but it certainly includes the topics that you discussed in an intro philosophy class, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think of these topics as things that lots of different people uh, can take an interest in, people from different eras, different cultures and so forth, different uh, mm -hmm. you know, people with different professional backgrounds and so forth. So that's what I think of philosophy as being. I don't think of it as a, you might think of it as a sort of social object, for example, as a discipline or mm -hmm. something like that. And th it is interesting to think of it that way. But in this context, I'm thinking of it as just a, a, a big subject matter or a collection of subject matters that you can investigate. So let me get... Uh, this right. So you're understanding philosophy here as a set of questions, a bunch of questions about, well, about metaphysics, about philosophy of mind, about those things. So it's not really a professional discipline. So you're not treating philosophy here as the academic discipline of philosophy. Yeah, I think, I think a word like philosophy, similar to a word like uh, history or economics or mm. chemistry can, can mean several different things. Sometimes it means a certain sort of subject matter that, a certain, that people can be interested in and investigate. Sometimes it means uh, a discipline, a social, a social thing, like a, a group of people organized in a certain way that are interested in this question. And you can go back and forth between those two things. Uh, but in, in the context of this book and in questions about philosophical progress, I take philosophy here to be the question of the the subject matter, not so much the discipline. As I said, I think there are interesting things about the discipline to discuss and the interaction between philosophy in the disciplinary sense and in the subject matter sense is quite interesting. But in the first instance, I'm thinking of it as a subject matter. Okay. So how should we understand the question about progress? So you're talking about philosophical progress. So what does progress here mean? Are you concerned about the products of philosophy? that philosophers have somehow given us the solution to the ultimate question to life, the universe and everything. <laughs> <laughs> to quote uh, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the, to the Galaxy. Right, yeah. right. Um, well, uh, pr progress, by progress here, I mean what is sometimes thought of as epistemic progress. Oh. And by that, I mean progress in coming to know certain things. So the question intuitively is, do we know more about philosophical topics uh, now than we did in the past? Or to put it slightly differently, there's a bunch of questions that we ask about this subject matter. Is it the case that we uh, in the past have come to know answers to this question, these questions or questions of this type? And is it reasonable for us to assume that we're going to come to know answers to that, 
questions of that type in the future. That's what it would mean to make progress. So it's, it's really tied to a notion of, of coming to know something or, or a sort of increase, an increase in our, our knowledge of these sorts of subject matters. Mm -hmm. um, I should say that the notion of progress is a somewhat tricky one. Um, in the first, the first thing to say about it is that it, uh, you don't make progress as such. It doesn't really make any sense to just talk about progress as such. Progress is always relative to an aim. Mm -hmm. So you can, you, when you, when you, when you, if, if you just say, you know, I'm, I'm walking in the direction of somebody's house, have I made progress? There's no real answer to that question. You need to specify what aim I have. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing is that you can make progress on very trivial things on, uh, you know, you can make progress on, you know, doing the dishes, for example, if you're doing the dishes, <laughs> I can ask you, have you made progress? It's a perfectly reasonable question. It means relative to an aim that you have, how close are you to achieving that aim? Uh -huh. um, and I think of epistemic progress as roughly like that. We're aiming at, we're in the background is an assumption about what our aim is, namely to come to know the answer to certain questions. And the question is how, how have we achieved that aim or not? And that's what's, that's what's at issue for me. So it's really epistemic progress. A further point is that the sort of rhetoric of progress in, especially in intellectual contexts, uh -huh. is not terribly pleasant historically. It's, uh, <laughs> A lot of it involves sort of, you know, often uh, it's, it's often connected to sort of colonialism and so forth and people lecturing people about what kinds of, you know, what kinds of technological advances, for example, they ought to pursue in certain cases or perhaps what kinds of moral views they ought to adopt. Uh -huh. Notice that that's, that's, that's a notion of progress where the aims are, are, are sort of slightly hidden and moralized in certain ways and probably quite objectionable. Uh -huh. But that's not the notion of progress that I have in mind here at all. It's, it's just progress on uh, coming to know the answers to certain kinds of questions. Okay, so the idea of progress for you is epistemic. That is, uh, we have progressed in philosophy if we have knowledge of or more knowledge than we have in the past about these topics in philosophy yes but yes. is philosophical progress like progress in science where a consensus of the academic community is necessary is that the case here well it's an interesting question the the, the contrast between philosophy and science especially about progress is certainly extremely interesting oh. i wouldn't quite say that in science agreement is necessary uh, that sounds as if you don't get progress unless you have agreement. I think that in science, um, it's true that you get agreement, but I tend to think of agreement as simply evidence uh -huh. of epistemic progress. It's not sort of required for it or something of the kind. You could, in principle, make progress in science uh, without having agreement. Because in science, I think one makes progress in exactly the same way I just mentioned, namely if you come to know the answers to certain topics that you're interested in, uh -huh. uh, uh, in, in a way that you didn't in the past. And that, that would be, that would be, um, that would be progress in science, whether or not one has agreement is a further question. Logically speaking, you can, you can, you could, you could know more in the, in the present than you do in the past without being able to convince anybody else. <laughs> right. And also, it's also true that uh, there could be agreement in certain cases where um, we don't actually know mm -hmm. uh, the truth of the situation. So I don't think that while it's true that people emphasize agreement in the case of science, uh, I don't think that's sort of necessary for it. I mean, in general, the, co the, co the contrast between philosophy and science on this topic, I think, I think needs to be treated with some caution. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of an, uh, an older notion of, of science where it means uh, something like a s systematic inquiry into pretty much any topic at all. Um, and the, you know, the, the German word Wissenschaft is somewhat, sometimes used for that, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of very general notion of science. And by that standard, I think if you ask what does progress mean in 
using science in that very general sense. I think it means epistemic progress of the kind that I've been describing. And it's also true that philosophy is by that standard a kind of science because it, it too is a kind of systematic inquiry into a bunch of topics. Mm -hmm. uh, what we call science typically is a sort of restriction on that general notion. It's systematic inquiry that has certain other properties, like perhaps it's highly mathematized or highly experimental or perhaps focused on particular topics like you know, the biological world or the physical world in a certain sense. Those are restrictions on that notion, that very general notion of science. But I think that actually the notion of progress that applies to them is logically speaking, just, like, just the one that applies uh, in systematic inquiry in general. Namely, you're just trying to come to know the answer to certain things and you make progress if you have and you don't make <laughs> progress if you haven't, basically. Okay, so the idea of progress here, is it something cumulative or is it something like Kuhn has said about paradigm shifts? Um, yeah, I'm thinking of it more, I'm not thinking of it in terms of paradigm shifts, partly because it's very hard to know what, <laughs> you know, how many paradigm shifts have happened and, uh, you know, some people say, yes, there, 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 there are paradigm shifts, but there's only ever been one, you know, and I'm not sure that that's true. The history of science is a very compl complicated matter. Um, so I guess I'm thinking of it more in a cumulative way. Yes, that uh, it's just a matter of whether we, whether it's true that we know more now than we did in the past on these questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think that philosophy is different from science in the matter of paradigm shifts. I mean, if there really were a paradigm shift, then science is going to look very different but I think philosophy is probably going to look pretty different too. Well, let, let's think about the history of philosophy for a bit. So some say that in the 20th century, there's a real paradigm shift when we shifted to a kind of more analytic way of doing philosophy. Isn't that a kind of progress in doing philosophy as well? Yeah, it's a kind of progress. I mean, it's a, it's certainly a, a, a kind of progress, whether it's a paradigm shift, Mm -hmm. is an interesting question. I mean, f f philosophy in the 20th century is interesting in many, many ways. Uh, for one thing, it's, um, it becomes part of a sort of professionalized discipline, uh, yes. <laughs> which it hadn't ever done before. Uh, also, another related to that, it, it becomes an extra, a, a sort of basically a secular way of investigating these questions. The question, the, the sort of basic topics of philosophy historically, or at least in the European tradition, are um, religious questions, mm -hmm. or at least were completely discussed in a religious context. And that isn't surprising because the institutions that, uh, you know, like institutions like universities were historically religious institutions. So um, that what happens in the 20th century is that all of this becomes secularized and you investigate questions like the foundations of morality, for example, mm -hmm. in a completely secular way. Uh, that doesn't mean that people aren't interested in religious questions. It means that they don't take religious premises for granted in their, in their in investigations of these questions, just as they don't take religious premises for granted in their investigations of other mm -hmm. scientific questions, for example. So I do think that's a big, very big change. Um, in analytic philosophy, it's true that there was a massive change in the logic, the underlying logic, and the idea that you could apply logic and mathematize techniques to these questions. That was certainly a very big change. Whether it's a paradigm shift, <laughs> I, I don't really know, partly because I don't, I don't fully know how to use that word in these sorts of contexts. I do know that it tends to get thrown around a lot, mm. and mm. Uh, I tend not to want to throw it around, I suppose. Okay, so that's fair enough. Should, should we judge progress in philosophy wholesale or is it more of a specific, area specific? That is, is our judgment about the whole philosophy or is it more of like, here's some progress in the philosophy of mind, here's some progress in metaphysics. So is it a wholesale thing or is it a more area specific thing? Well, I think it's both. I mean, you can ask both sorts of questions. Uh, you can focus on a particular area and ask whether you know more about this area than you did in the past. You can put those all, all of those answers together and then you get a kind of wholesale 
view. You can also ask wholesale about whether whether this whether there's anything special about these areas that somehow mean that they couldn't possibly that you know a notion of progress doesn't apply, mm -hmm. or that, that this the investigation for some reason doesn't assume the form that investigation into some other areas assume. So I think that you know both of those things are true. Sometimes people who are concerned about philosophical progress make exceptions, like they sometimes say, well, apart from logic, <laughs> uh, you know, logic is uh, uh, somehow, perhaps because of its connection to mathematics or something, mm -hmm. it's sort of an exception, but, you know, philosophy of mind or something, that's hopeless. <laughs> so that, that, that they, they do make exceptions, and so they don't want to make judgments wholesale. I guess I... I tend to think both both sorts of questions are are are, uh, are are of interest and should be pursued. I'm somewhat more confident in certain areas than in others, I mm -hmm. suppose, because I know more about certain areas than in others. Um, but beyond that, I don't actually see any principled reason why questions of progress should be different in any particular area. Okay. Now let's go to the. You, the spectrum of views here about philosophical progress. So among philosophers themselves, there are pessimists about philosophical progress. Dave Chalmers calls them the glass half empty folks. On the other hand of the spectrum, we have the optimist, uh, the glass half full folks. So could you describe this attitudes about progress and philosophy? Yeah, so I mean, maybe the, the First thing to say is that I don't don't much like the framing of the issue in terms of glass half full and glass half empty. <laughs> okay. um, and that's partly because it's it's sort of you can kind of see why. I mean, it's partly because if you've got a glass and it's half full, then it's a kind of it's kind of up to you as to whether you describe it as half full or half empty. There's no sort of fact of the matter really. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it looks as if, if you frame the issue in that way, then you've already, it, it's already kind of, you know, matter. I don't think that's the right way to think about it at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would strongly resist that way of thinking about the issue. Um, for me, the, uh, the optimistic view is a sort of, um, it's like a, uh, it's roughly like a scientific realist view applied to philosophy. You might mm -hmm. think of it that way. So what does that mean? It means intuitively that uh, at least two things. One is that in philosophy, as in other fields, one is aiming to come to know things. That's what we're aiming to do. And moreover, that we've achieved that in some way. And, in the past and therefore have a reasonable expectation of doing that in the future. Mm -hmm. um, notice that in the case of scientific realism, suppose we were discussing whether to be a scientific realist about, you know, physics or maths or something, you wouldn't say, hey, it's, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. <laughs> That's sort of not the way you think about it. You think, well, the scientific realist is making a claim about what the aims of these mm -hmm enterprises are and whether whether the historical facts pan out in a particular way and it doesn't seem it's not just a matter of taste as to whether that's the case so likewise i think in philosophy uh the optimistic view uh is really that that we're sort of aiming to come to know things and that moreover we have done so then what's the pessimistic view well the pessimistic view is you can think of it initially at any rate as just the straight denial of that Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means, well, um, either you think that either you grant the aim, either you say, yeah, our aim is to come to know things, but we just haven't done it for whatever reason and we've got no prospect of doing so, uh, mm -hmm. perhaps because uh, perhaps because we've got no methods for doing so or perhaps because it's too difficult or perhaps because the you know level of disagreement is too high or something at any rate there, there's something that blocks us achieving this in a way that we may have achieved it in the past um the other thing you can do is sort of deny that that's our aim in the first place that we're just not <laughs> aiming at, at get, coming to know things and, and that's actually a so you might say what, what could it be apart from that well it might be 
instead of coming to know the truth of these matters, you might be aiming at a certain kind of coherence, for mm -hmm. example, of your views. Um, Helen Beebe has a recent paper defending a view like this, and she refers to this as equilibrism. Equilibrism is the theory that we're trying to, what you're trying to do in philosophy is not so much come to know things or come to the truth about things, but, but come to put your views into an equilibrium with other things. It's a kind of like a coherence mm -hmm. view. And if you did hold a view like that, then um, you, uh, you, you would basically deny that uh, you're aiming to come to know the, uh, the truth of certain things. So that would, be, that would be a kind of pessimism in the relevant sense. Uh, and then, of course, in the background are, are, are questions about whether you hold these views in general or not. Like some sometimes people might say, um, well, uh, sometimes people might say, well, I'm, a, you know, I'm a scientific anti-realist in general. So therefore, I'm a scientific, <laughs> I'm an anti-realist about philosophy. That, that's a kind of position you can hold. I'm mostly interested in um, versions of these positions which apply to philosophy in uh, in particular, not in general. So the, the, the question is roughly whether, suppose you were a realist about physics and archaeology and linguistics, mm -hmm. should you be a realist or not about philosophy? That's really the, the sort of issue. Okay, so, but that way of setting up the debate between the optimist and the pessimist seem, seems to presuppose that, well, philosophical questions have real answers and there are facts of the matter that could sway one way or the other. Yeah. Do you hold that view? Obviously, you hold that view. But what do you say to those people that don't hold that view? That there's simply no fact of the matter in our in philosophical questions. Well, um, it, it it's it's hard to see what. I mean. You could argue in specific cases that, the, mm -hmm. that there's no fact of the matter, but on the face of it, the arguments seem to be factual questions. Like, you know, what, what's the relation between the mind and the body? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, is the mind identical to the body or not? Well, that just looks like a straightforward factual question. It may be that it's impossible for us to come to know it, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, just from a logical point of view, it looks like a factual question. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know uh, it it you could have an argument that it somehow isn't or it's somehow got a false presupposition or it's somehow indeterminate. We'd have to look at that argument, mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's uh, that's something that could pan out. But it's not on the face of it. A uh, you don't want to begin by assuming that it's uh, it's somehow indeterminate. Nor do you want to begin by assuming that philosophical questions are in general indeterminate I and mean, it's a bit hard to see how that can be the case i mean in in in, in cases of you know people think about uh the normative realm so they ask about you know what whether morality or rationality or something are, are objective mm -hmm. um there people might be worried again about a certain kind of indeterminacy and it's possible that some questions turn out to be indeterminate but the topics themselves look as if they're factual topics, not dissimilar to questions like, you know, what, you know, what happened in the Reformation? Uh, <laughs> or, you know, these are, these are topics that we can then investigate. So likewise, the mind-body problem or the objectivity of morality are kind of topics that we can investigate. Uh, from, a, from a kind of a scientific realist point of view, you're sort of assuming that there's some some truth about these topics. Maybe the maybe maybe the truth turns out to be wildly different from what we imagined. That's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, that's what we're assuming. We wouldn't begin by assuming that it's a kind of indeterminate matter. It may be that some questions are indeterminate for what's one reason or another. But that would have to be that you know that would have to be shown. Yeah, actually, a negative answer to a philosophical question is progress as well. Don't you think? That, that is true. That is true. So a lot of people who are, that is true. So an interesting feature of this discussion is a lot of, a lot of people who are pessimists often make an exception in the case of negative answers. Mm -hmm. So they say, ah, yes, we've established that negative things, like, you know, knowledge, knowledge is not justified true belief, or uh -huh. something like that. And that's, that's the limit 
that's the only kind of progress that you can make. Um, I, I try to deal with this in a number of ways. One, one thing I say is that um, uh, a lot of philosophical questions have the form of sort of paradoxes. Mm -hmm. So what we, what you, when you end up formulating them, you have sort of a bunch of inconsistent, it's a bunch of claims which in, taken individually are plausible, but then together form an inconsistency. And um, if, you, if, if you ask me to solve a question like that, but you tell me that I'm not allowed to say anything negative or saying something negative isn't real progress or something, then what you've effectively told me is that I can't possibly solve the question. <laughs> of course, if you've got an inconsistency, you got to say something negative in order to solve the question. So it can't be that saying something negative is somehow to be poo-pooed or not to be thought of as a genuine kind of progress or something. Mm -hmm. uh, because lots of questions require you to say that uh, in solving them. And another thing to say is that uh, um, often when you make a negative claim, there's a positive claim that's just in the background. Or, mm -hmm. So that you, you say, um, 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 you know, for example, uh, a topic that is actually quite closely connected to the topic of uh, pessimism and optimism in philosophy is the question of what, what kinds of patterns of explanation can we offer for certain kinds of questions. And uh, David Lewis has a, uh, has a paper where he points out negatively that you don't need to, when you answer a, a why question and so provide an explanation, mm -hmm. you don't need to provide an answer of the kind that, that Hempel thought you did. <laughs> which is a kind that involves uh, a premise which articulates uh, an empirical law or something like that. Mm -hmm. And what you and the idea is that that's a negative claim, but then there's a positive claim uh, that's closely closely allied to that, which is roughly, well, what you really need to do is to provide some information about explanatory structures, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's a positive claim, but the negative, so the negative claim and the positive claim sort of come together in that proposal. And I think that's very often a pattern that you get a, a negative claim in philosophy, but you get a positive claim about what the possibilities might be. Mm. Um, so it's like uh, saying that, it that way. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like saying that this is not the case, but this could be the case. Is that the yeah, exactly. So if you, if you say this isn't the case, then you've, you said, well, it could be that this is the case, or that you've, ra you've, you've sort of raised all these other possibilities about how to investigate this mm -hmm. question. And those are, those, that's a positive move. So uh, the, whole, the whole thing about, oh, it's only negative. Oh, <laughs> I'm resistant to that as well. Okay, so your view is reasonable optimism. So how do you distinguish your view from other sorts of optimism, like an unreasonable optimism? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a, I'm an optimist and I'm a reasonable optimist. So what does reasonable mean? I guess it means two main things. Um, um, one is that if often that people who are defending a kind of optimistic position, I think they'll give you they'll give you the following kind of speech or some version of the following mm. kind of speech. They'll say, philosophy up till now has just been a history of failure. <laughs> but, but now I, I have discovered a, a method which is going to put it on the sure path to science mm -hmm. or something like that. Some version of that speech that, you know, up till now things have been terrible but I have this brilliant idea which, which will change everything. <laughs> That's a kind of optimistic view, right? Because it's, uh, it's not an optimistic view based on the history of the subject, but it's a sort of an optimistic view in the sense that you have built this amazing methodology, which is now gonna just solve all the questions. Um, I think you can find versions of that idea in different parts of the history of philosophy. Yep. <laughs> um, now I'm, so that's a version of what I call an unreasonable kind of optimism. And, and why do I disagree with that? Well, for two reasons. One is I don't, I'm kind of a, like a lot of other philosophers, I don't think that philosophy has a special methodology mm -hmm. distinctive from other sort of areas of inquiry. 
So therefore, I don't think it has a special one that, that I have discovered. <laughs> it couldn't possibly be true. It just, uh, there's no, it's not as if I, I haven't, I just haven't been smart enough to come up with it. It doesn't have one, so I couldn't possibly discover it. Um, so it's not as if somebody claims to have discovered a, a new methodology for philosophy, then I think the appropriate attitude is extreme skepticism because it's not the kind of thing that, that you could discover because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason why I don't like that view. Another reason why I don't like that view is that I don't agree with the historical claim that, that philosophy ha has been a history of failure up until now. Uh, I think that if you think about it correctly, if you clearly formulate uh, what the questions at issue are, then it's not the case that it's a history of failure. And so that's, that's the sort of sense in which I want to advance a kind of reasonable optimism that it's, it's optimistic, but it's not, um, it doesn't say that, you know, up until now it's been a failure and now we have this incredible new methodology. None of that is certainly, certainly true. So those, that's, that's one way in which it's reasonable, uh, I hope, at any rate. Um, another way is that it's not, when I say that, you know, um, we know more now than we did in the past, um, I don't mean to sort of tip over into sort of triumphalism. I don't want to say, ah, there's the grand march uh, where it's always forward, you know, ever upward and onward and so forth. I don't think that's true. I think, uh, I think that r roughly the idea of reasonable optimism is to try to portray philosophy as not dissimilar to other forms of inquiry. Uh, like in, you know, other, it's not exactly like physics or mathematics, but the, pr the, the progress in those areas is sort of off the charts. It's sort of, you know, unbelievable. The interesting question about progress in those areas is why it's so extreme. Uh, the idea that philosophy doesn't approximate those, those theories, those, those sorts of areas of inquiry is not a good reason at all to believe that um, it's, um, it, it doesn't make any progress. In the book, I call this the Babe Ruth point. The Babe Ruth point is that the mere fact that you're not as good a baseball player as Babe Ruth, it doesn't mean you're not a good baseball player. Right. So physics, physics and maths are kind of the Babe Ruths of, uh, of, uh, of uh, intellectual endeavor or scientific <laughs> endeavor. And, and there's loads of fields that aren't like them, but that doesn't mean that those fields don't make progress. That would be a very bad inference. Um, so I don't, want to, I don't want to be a sort of triumphalist about philosophy either. I don't want to think that it's sort of, you know, really this amazing field. I don't think that's true. I think it's roughly like lots of other fields. Um, mm -hmm. uh, okay. So that's the other sense in which it's reasonable, I hope. Your main argument for your position is premised on the idea that philosophical problems are either boundary problems or constitutive problems. So what do you mean by a boundary problem here and can you give an example yeah so uh, let me just back up a little bit so any arguments in metaphilosophy which we're now talking about we're talking about an area of metaphilosophy are going to confront this sort of problem which is that you need to theorize about philosophical problems mm. and and it's difficult to do that partly because your philosophy already is pitched at a very abstract level. And so if you go even higher, it's, <laughs> it's difficult, but it's also difficult because you want to make claims about philosophical problems, but you don't want to kind of get mired into the detail of particular philosophical problems, because then you just start doing first order philosophy mm -hmm. rather than, rather than meta philosophy. Um, and so both of these arguments are sort of, uh, attempts to evade this this kind of problem, and the way that I try to evade it is by focusing on what you might uh, focusing on the idea that philosophical problems come in certain typical forms, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of relatively well known idea in philosophy. I certainly claim no originality in, in thinking of it, but it's uh, I don't think it's been quite used to argue for for progress in quite this way. So the idea of a so one form is what I call in the book a boundary problem. Um, and the rough idea of a problem like that is, first of all, 
that you distinguish between certain different classes of facts, like you know, A facts and B facts. And they could be any sorts of facts, like uh, in the mind-body case, they're psychological facts and physical facts. Or in the free will and determinism case, they're facts about free will and facts, facts that are determined in a certain kind of way. Uh -huh. Or uh, in, you know, in, in questions about morality, they might be moral facts and natural facts, something like that. Uh -huh. So this is a very typical thing that happens. You divide things between, you divide facts or putative facts at any rate between, you know, the A's and the B's. And then what you do is you set up effectively a kind of how possible question. So you want to say, okay, so on the one hand, there are A facts, there are psychological facts, there are facts about freedom, there are facts about uh, morality. Mm -hmm. But then you articulate inconsistent claims on those facts. So you say, well, there are these facts, but they, on the one hand, they must bear a certain relation to the contrastive set of facts, the B facts. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's impossible that they bear that relation to it. So you end up with an inconsistency, basically. So in the, in the mind-body case, for example, we have the idea that there are psychological facts. You know, I do feel the pain in my foot or something. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the first claim. The second claim is something like, well, if, if there are such facts, then they must be physical facts, let's say or bear a certain relation to physical facts. And then thirdly, the, is the idea that if there are these facts, then they can't bear that relation to mm -hmm. physical facts. And so those three things are inconsistent with each other because the, uh, each one will entail the negation of the third. And that's what I mean by a boundary problem. And what I do in the book is I give lots of different examples of, of problems of this kind that fit this general structure. Uh, and now what has this got to do with progress in philosophy? Well, the idea is roughly that uh, we can think of, the, we, well, we begin with the premise that many philosophical problems assume this form, not all, of course, but many do. And then we can make the claim that if that's the case, then if we look back over the history of the subject, we can see that we've solved problems of that kind. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives us a reason to believe that uh, that uh, a certain kind of reasonable optimism is is true. And why is that? Why is it the case that if we have the problems in this form, then we can see that we've solved them? Well, one thing is that if you if you squarely focus on problems of this form, then it's relatively clear how you might solve them. to solve them would be to res to reject one or other of the premises that lead to the contradiction. Mm -hmm. You don't, for example, need to give some, take again the mind-body case, to reject a problem like that, you could reject the idea that um, if, there are, if there are psychological facts, then they must bear a certain relation to these sorts of physical facts. You could reject that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would have solved that problem uh, without giving some general account of the psychological facts. That's a further issue entirely. Right. So the, the, the point is that if you focus on problems of this form, it becomes clearer what it, what, it, what it would be to solve questions. And that means that when you go back and look at the historical record, you can see whether problems of that kind have been solved or not. The, the, if you just sort of ask yourself in the abstract whether people have solved philosophical questions, the issue is sort of almost impossible to deal with. <laughs> but if you at least have it in this form, then uh, I think you've got something to look, look for when you look at the historical record. And uh, so what I, what I want to do is to say that you've, we've solved problems of this form in the past and therefore should have reasons to solve them again. I should say that this, this way of thinking about philosophical problems has a connection to the thing that we started with. We started with by saying, what's philosophy? Mm -hmm. and my answer was, it's a bunch of topics. But I think it's very important to distinguish the topics from the questions that we ask about the topics. And so what I'm claiming here is that the questions that we ask about the topics often have this form in, in the boundary. For the, in, they, they are boundary problems, to use the terminology in the book. Uh, and if they have that form, then, um, then uh, the historical record speaks in favour of a certain kind of progress.
Um, and th so that's, that's the structure of the argument in the case of boundary problems. The structure of the, pro the argument in the case of constitutive problems is rather similar. It just yeah. says, um, well, some problems certainly have the, the uh, certainly boundary problems. Other problems are constitutive problems in the sense that we're trying to give information uh, about what I call in the book constitutive structures, structures of, of in virtue of what something is a conscious state or in virtue of what some act is a moral act or something like that. Um, you assume to begin with that there are structures of that kind and then you, what a philosophical theory would be, would be a, a theory that provides information about those constitutive structures. And the question is only whether we've got better information now than we had in the past. And if we have, then uh, <laughs> we, are, we can assert uh, that we have made progress. So, um, so it's sort of somewhat similar in the sense that it focuses on, uh, well, well in, in the constitutive case, again, we're asking what exactly is the form of these questions and what would constitute an answer to these questions. And if you're clear about that, then I think um, the, uh, as I say, I think uh, progress becomes, claims about progress become quite reasonable. Okay, so let, let me try to understand this uh, two types of problems in philosophy. So you have the boundary problem, which specifies here are some facts that we know, fact A, and here are other facts that we know, fact B, and there's some inconsistency if we assert both of those facts. So there's progress, or we have solved a, partic a particular problem of that kind if we reject either there are facts, or which are A facts or B facts, or the relationship between A and B. Is that the, the boundary kind stuff? Yeah, that's right. So the, 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 the problem will be presented as an inconsistency between the claim that there are A facts mm -hmm. and the claim that if there are such facts, they must bear a certain relation to B facts. And if there are these facts, then they can't bear that relation to B facts. And so if you reject any of those, you solve the problem. Okay. So the constitutive uh, set of problems are problems where it's more of an explanatory problem, right? So how do I explain yeah. A facts in terms of or in virtue of B facts? Or does a B fact, uh, sorry, does an A fact necessitate the B fact and so on and so forth? So that's a kind of explanatory. Yeah, right. It's a good question. Actually, I start off my, in the book, I start off my discussion of cons the constitutive issues about the idea that philosophical problems are constitutive problems by notice, noticing that at least some ways of, of, of focusing on constitutive problems makes them look awfully like boundary problems. <laughs> so there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between the two of them. Mm. Uh, what I do is um, I, I try to argue that in the true that what I'm imagining, I suppose, is somebody saying to me when I've argued about the boundary problem, somebody could come back and say, "Well, yeah, the, the, you've sort of shown that there's progress with respect to these logical puzzles, <laughs> but I want to know the I want to I want I want to know what consciousness is or what morality is or." something like that, uh, what knowledge is, uh, what it consists in. And so what I'm trying to do in that part of the discussion is to deal with that sort of person who I take quite seriously. That is, it. I think you could easily have that attitude with respect to the discussion of the boundary problems and emphasize that even if what I said about that is true, it doesn't seem to scratch the itch that you want scratched. <laughs> And so what I try to do there is I say, well, what is it to give an explanation of these things? What would that even mean? And as I say, I, I, I tend to think what it would mean is to give information about constitutive structures relevant to these things. That's what it would be to do, to give more accurate information, better information and so forth. Just like in a, in a historical case, if you know more about, you know, the Reformation than, uh, than we do now, what does that mean? It means that you've provided more information about the enormous causal histories that lead up to the, to the Reformation, or moreover, the subsequent causal histories of that. Mm -hmm. So there is this massive causal system. Mm 
the Reformation picks out some sort of rough area in that big causal system. And we know more about it if we know more, more information about it. Likewise, I'm thinking there's a huge constitutive system. Uh, uh, the world contains or consists in some enormous system of, of facts that are constituted by each other. When we're interested in about, in, when we're interested in the constitution of moral facts, we're targeting a particular area there and we want information about that. Mm -hmm. And we make progress if we uh, have got better information about that than we had in the past. It's not logically that different from someone looking at the Reformation. So that's, that's the sort of attitude, uh, that's the way that I would try to deal with that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've defended your optimism against critics like Dave Chalmers and Peter Van and Wagen. So Dave, I take it, has a more empirical argument premised on the idea that there is no collective convergence to the big questions of philosophy. Now Van and Wagen, on the other hand, has a more, I think, a priori argument about the insoluble nature of philosophical questions. So could you expound on these two arguments in your replies to them? Sure. Um, yeah, both, both the Chalmers argument and the Van Inwagen argument, as I think um, Chalmers endorses his argument. I think Van Inwagen doesn't quite endorse the argument, but he's certainly interested in it and is very worried by it. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's how I, I read him. Both of those philosophers are interested in, broadly speaking, arguments from disagreement. So they want to take as a premise that there's disagreement in philosophy and draw somehow a conclusion from this that there isn't any progress in philosophy. That's the way that I'm understanding, okay. understanding them. And <clears throat> the crucial question, well, the, 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 the issues are basically, how do you get from a premise about disagreement to a conclusion about pessimism? <laughs> and the reason that that's interesting is because nobody can deny that the, the that there is that the premise about disagreement is true. That is that there clearly has got to be disagreement um, uh, because there clearly is. So that's true. But the question is, how do we go from that to to pessimism about uh, for, about progress in philosophy? And one way to see that there, there needs to be an argument here is to notice that claims about disagreement are true all over the intellectual world, all over science and history and, you know, other areas. Uh, there's, of course, disagreement all over the place. Uh, <laughs> but we, we don't conclude from that that there's no progress in these other areas. Or at any rate, if you did, if you did conclude from that, then there's a sense in which uh, I, I tend to lose interest because what I'm interested in is whether, whether philosophy is somehow special. Okay. So the question is, how do you go from a premise about disagreement to a conclusion about pessimism? Um, well, and the Chalmers argument and the Van Inwagen argument um, offer alternative routes from the premise to the conclusion. The way in which Chalmers argues is he says, um, um, you're right. It, it, the, the, I think actually in both arguments, there's a kind of mix of empirical and a priori considerations, but it is true that for in the Chalmers argument, the empirical considerations are sort of prominent. Uh, so he says that, um, that we just know from surveys like the Phil Papers survey, <laughs> there's an enormous amount of disagreement um, in philosophy. And then he has, so that's his empirical premise. Uh, he also thinks that's obvious just from straightforward observation about philosophy. Anybody who knows anything about it will assert that there's a lot of disagreement. And of course, in a sense, he's right. Um, and then he has what he calls a bridge premise, which says, well, if there's a lot of, if there's no, he doesn't put it in terms of disagreement, actually. He puts it in terms of no large scale convergence to the, uh, in philosophy to, and then the bridge premise is there's no large scale convergence uh, it's not just large scale, it's something else that's eluding me at the moment, but it's something like that. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no convergence of a certain kind, then there's no convergence to the truth. So there's no convergence to the truth. Okay. Now, the way in which I try to deal with this is 
by asking the question about what happens with Chalmers's argument if you rub out the word philosophy and write in the word physics? <laughs> okay, right. So formally speaking, the argument would then establish that there's no progress in physics. Now, of course, that is not part of the bargain. Mm -hmm. uh, Chalmers himself, when he discusses this, assumes, just as I do, that there is progress in physics. The question is whether philosophy is special. So he's interested in it in exactly the same sort of way as I am. So he doesn't think that's true. His bridge premise would be true in both cases. There's nothing in the bridge premise that makes any difference as to whether philosophy is an issue or physics is an issue. Mm -hmm. What about the first premise that there's, um, there isn't much convergence in philosophy? Is that true? Well, there's a sense in which that's true in physics too, because if you just look at physics, you look at contemporary physics, there's an enormous amount of disagreement in physics. Yep. Uh, just as there is in philosophy. So, so far, we haven't seen any reason to think <laughs> that philosophy is some sort of special mm. case. Now, of course, Dave uh, won't be moved by this. He will say, yes, but uh, in, in the case of philosophy, the problems are sort of perennial. The idea is that we've had this disagreement forever, or at, le at any rate, for a very long time. It doesn't really <laughs> matter how long. But that's the whole idea of there being perennial problems. Mm -hmm. Whereas that isn't true in physics. In physics, what's happened is that you've solved certain questions and then moved on to other questions. And while it's, of course, true that in contemporary physics, there's a lot of disagreement, uh, we don't have this sort of same kind of history that we have in, in philosophy. Well, at, at, that, at, that, at that point, I will say in response to him two things. Uh, first, actually, the argument, the empirical argument from Phil Papers that he gets from the study doesn't in any way support that claim. <laughs> How so? Because it, it only supports the claim that contemporary philosophers disagree about Certain questions matter, like yeah. what they mean by, you know, is morality objective or mm. is physicalism true or something. And of course that's true. Of course they disagree. But that's not the issue. The issue is whether the very same disagreements have been at issue in the history of the subject. And the Phil Papers survey couldn't in principle tell us that because it, it just tells us, in fact, uh, about how things are in contemporary mm -hmm. philosophy. And in fact, as, as, as Chalmers and Bourget point out in their original paper on this, they are focusing just on labels without even explaining the labels <laughs> because they think it's kind of impossible to do the test if you, if you mm. explain the labels. And they may well be right. I'm not criticizing the way that they've set up. But I'm just pointing out that if, once you realize that in order to get a, a conclusion about pessimism out of this argument, you need the premise to be about what's you, you need a premise to be about the history of the subject, not just about what's going on now and not just about how people use labels now. It's obvious that people use labels now to disagree with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one reason to resist the, the premise in the sense that it would yield the interesting conclusion. Another one is that I don't think it's true that uh, philosophical problems are perennial. So an issue that I didn't, we didn't really look at when I was telling you about the boundary problems or the constitutive problems is that an important feature of, of the way in which I try to develop those arguments is by pointing out that while it's true, if we look at the history of the subject that different people in different epochs or eras would discussing the same kind of topic, that is. They somehow, they're discussing the relation between the mind and the body. They often ask very different questions mm. about that, about that question. So the example I use a lot is just, you know, contrasting Descartes on the real distinction between mind and body, the kind of argument he gives in Meditation 6, uh, versus Frank Jackson's argument about Mary mm -hmm. in, uh, in Epiphenomenal Qualia and other papers. So you might say, well, they're really just discussing the same topic. You know, Jackson, in a certain sense, is just banging on about the same thing that Descartes, Descartes was talking yeah. about. And if you think that, if you think that they're really talking about exactly the same question, perhaps just with slightly different outer clothing or something, but underneath it's the same question. If you think that, then it is very difficult to not be a pessimist, actually. 
it doesn't quite follow that you're a pessimist, but it's very difficult not to be a pessimist. And the reason is sort of straightforward because you could sort of think, well, the problem that, that Jackson is talking about is a sort of an open question in an obvious sense because people are discussing it now. You know, there are people debating it back and forth and so forth. So it's an open question now. And if Descartes was asking the very same question, well, just by logic, his, that question would have to be open as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in other words, what you, think, what you think is that you've got the history of this problem or the discussion of this problem where it's just open all the way and there just doesn't seem to be any progress at all. But actually, when you look at the problem that Descartes was raising and the problem that, that Jackson is raising, while it is true that they're on the same topic, it's not at all clear that they're the same problem. But for one thing, they understand the relevant notions in completely different ways. So, you know, for, for Descartes, it's it's crucial that matter is just extension in space. Mm. His argument won't work as he himself sets out quite clearly, his argument won't work unless that is true. Whereas for Jackson, the physical, what Mary can know in her room has got nothing to do with extension. It's got to do with uh, all of the, uh, all of the information that's in contemporary, what he thinks of as the contemporary physical science that he follows from that. Mm. That's just completely different from extension. And likewise, actually, when they're thinking about the mind aspect of it, so that's the difference on the matter aspect. If you look at the mind aspect, they're talking about something completely different as well, because for, for, for Descartes, what was important was, you know, what he thought of as sort of higher cognitive faculties, reasoning, language, and so forth. For Jackson, those, those questions pose no particular problem, mm. at least as far as physicalism goes. What's really difficult are aspects about sensation or perception or something. Aspects which incidentally Descartes thought posed no particular problem. <laughs> so so the, the issue, the actual topic that they're talking about are, are really quite different, even though there's a sense in which of course they're both talking about the mind-body problem considered as a topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so it isn't true that the same problem, that there isn't really some perennial problem. What's true is that there's a, that Jackson is raising a certain question, which in a, perhaps is a successor or bears some relation to the Cartesian problem, but it's not the same problem. Mm -hmm. And moreover, if once you realize that the problems are distinct, then you can go back and look at the Cartesian problem and ask what happened to it. And the answer is it basically was solved. It's not solved in exactly the way that Descartes anticipated, that's true, but it's solved in the sense that uh, nobody, nobody accepts his idea that matter is extension. It's not <laughs> controversial. That is that's completely uncontroversial. Uh -huh. Everybody rejects that. Mm -hmm. And if you reject that, you just don't have his reasoning for the distinction between mind and body. Because you can't say that you know a lot, you, you have a clear and distinct idea of matter, and you can see that it doesn't, it's distinct from, mm -hmm. from mind because you don't have a clear and distinct idea of matter. And uh, so, uh, so it, it, that problem has been solved. So basically what we then have is we've got a series of problems and admittedly here we've just got a series of two, but let's just work with that. Where the earlier problem has been solved mm -hmm. and now we have a contemporary problem that hasn't been solved, let's say the Jackson problem. Well, that pattern is very similar to what you might think of in physics. In physics, you've got a series of problems on similar topics, like what the origin of the universe is or something. Uh, and, you know, earlier people made certain proposals. Those proposals turn out to be wrong or they raise certain problems. Those problems were solved. Now we have contemporary problems that we're discussing. So the idea is that if you think about the issues in these ways, then um, the, that, the idea that the problems are perennial just doesn't seem to be true. So that's the sort of, in a way, the more substantive objection I, I have to the, to the Chalmers style argument there, that uh, it just isn't true that the problems are perennial in the way that he assumes. <laughs> and as I said, he doesn't have any empirical evidence that they are either. Um, so that's the Chalmers argument. Uh, the Van Inwagen argument is another kind of disagreement argument. Uh, as you said, the sort of a priori, there's an empirical element here too, though the a priori element is certainly more prominent. But what, 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 he, what Van Inwagen does is, um, at least the way that I understand it, is that you begin by imagining a somewhat idealized situation where you have what 
are usually called epistemic peers, where you have two people disagreeing on a topic, mm -hmm. where it's assumed that perhaps they have exactly the same evidence available to them, perhaps they're equally good or both perhaps even perfectly rational in some versions. Uh, at, at, they're equally good and very, very good, in other words, at responding to that evidence and so forth. And yet they disagree on some claim. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe, <laughs> maybe one, one is a materialist, let's say, and the other one is a dualist, something like that. Um, so that you begin by that and then, you, then you, there's a lot of discussion in epistemology about what to say about such a, a case. And some people think that in that sort of situation, the, the two people involved in this disagreement should um, withhold judgment because you're in a situation, basically because you're in a situation in which you're confronted with someone who's got the same evidence as you have mm -hmm. and is just as good at responding to that evidence as you have, who holds a different view. Under those circumstances, the idea is that you should, uh, you should withhold judgment. Okay, so all of that is just about this idealized situation and an epistemological theory about what, what, should, what is true about that idealized situation. What has that got to do with philosophical progress? Well, the answer is that for the, the pessimist, that is a sort of microcosm of our contemporary situation or pre pr perhaps any discussion in philosophy. Any discussion in philosophy is a bit like that, mm -hmm. where you've got this, these disagreements between people who are epistemic peers. And in that case, you ought to withhold judgment, which means that while there might be a truth to the situation, we're never going to be able to articulate that truth. That's a kind of cartoonish, rather simplified <laughs> version of the, of the Van Inwaken style argument. Um, and again, I, I try to, uh, well, I actually engage with this argument in a slightly different way. For, uh, the first thing I say is, is just a version of what I just said in response to the Chalmers argument. And that is, well, let's have a look at this argument if again we rub out the word philosophy and write in the word physics. <laughs> because once again, you can stipulate that we've got a situation among epistemic peers. Um, they can be in the same evidential situation. They can be very, very good and equally good at responding to the evidence and yet they have a disagreement. What should one say in that, say, in that case? Well, if you really do believe that you should withhold judgment, well, you should say the same thing about uh, in, in the physical case as you would in the philosophy case because <laughs> um, there isn't any the, the the idea that you should withhold judgment has got nothing to do with the subject matter under discussion it's just got to do with this idealized situation and then the question is well is it true that in in, in, in you know in real physics as it were real physical disputes are a kind of properly modeled by this abstract situation if that were true, then we would get a kind of claim um, that uh, progress in physics is also impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think in response to that, the res one response would be, well, the you know, actual disagreements in physics aren't like this idealized case because they're, we're not really epistemic peers in the same way. We don't have exactly the same evidence available to us. Uh, we're not equally good at responding and so forth. But then, of course, you could say exactly the same thing in the philosophy case. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not clear that this idealized situation is, is true of any actual uh, philosophical dispute. I mean, th and there's lots of further issues in the background, which, you know, if I, uh, I'm, I'm not much of an epistemologist in the sense that people who discuss this seriously are mm -hmm. epistemologists. So there's lots of issues about whether it's even correct to think in the idealized case you should withhold judgment. Some people think you shouldn't. They think, no, no, you should still hold your view even if you meet someone like this. Uh -huh. um, and then there's lots of arguments about whether, whether in general, regardless of the distinction between philosophy and physics, uh, we are actual epistemic peers because to be epistemic peers means um, you have to agree on more or less everything except for the thing that you're disagreeing over. Uh -huh. And that... that in practice, that is almost never true. You disagree about lots of things. You disagree <laughs> about one thing, which means you're just not an epistemic peer in the technical sense, which means this, this style of argument just doesn't apply. So, so those, are, those are the lines of argument I take with response to the, in response to the, the, both the Chalmers argument and the Van Inwagen argument. Both are disagreement arguments, 
both try to show that there's something special about disagreements in philosophy that mean that you can move from a premise about disagreement to a conclusion about pessimism. And in both cases, I, I want to respond by saying it's not clear at all that there's anything special about philosophy. Uh, and if that's true, then um, either you think that progress is impossible in both philosophy and physics, which in the context is a position which I at least set aside and Dave and other people will set aside too, or, uh, or, or the arguments fail. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that was interesting. So let's go back to the, the Cartesian plus the Jackson case. So you're saying that mm -hmm. uh, in the, the Descartes case, he uses a premise that's questionable now. That's why we made progress. And in the Jackson case, he's talking about a different set of questions from Descartes. Almost the same topic, it's in the same topic, but they have differing questions. So yeah. you're saying that in the future, we could solve the Jackson case. Yeah, <laughs> I am saying that. I'm not saying that, then, think about the Descartes case for a minute. I'm claiming that the, the problem that he in fact raised, which is it roughly about the relationship between thought and extension, mm -hmm. that has been solved. But it is true that we have a problem now, which is a successor of that problem, mm -hmm. which is on the same topic and is formulated slightly differently. Uh, it seems to me quite possible that we would solve that problem and we might have a successor. We might not. It depends how things go. Mm -hmm. But if, if we solve the, the problem, the, the Jackson problem, we might end up with a successor problem. But if we did, then that would be a pattern that's typical in throughout the sciences, roughly speaking. It's quite common that you, you raise a certain problem in a certain topic, you solve it, and you get yeah. a successor problem. That's a very typical kind of <laughs> the idea is that in there's no reason at all why philosophy couldn't be thought of in exactly the same sort of way. Now, I understand why you are really a reasonable optimist. Now, uh -huh, <laughs> so finally, you've been in the trenches of philosophical debate, so to speak. So you have been in philosophy of mind, epistemology, metaphysics. But what's your advice for those who want to join our ranks as professional academic philosophers? Um, yeah, I certainly have been in the trenches. I can show you the <laughs> scars, if you like. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I think about this question not so much from the point of view of people wanting to get into academic philosophy. I mean, my, my advice to them is to, you know, to, to pursue their interests, to not be discouraged, not to quit, keep going, so forth. Yeah. But I also think that we should think about this question from, from the point of view of academic philosophers, because it's really our job to sort of encourage people like this mm -hmm. into our discipline. Now I'm thinking of, the, of philosophy as a discipline, as a social thing, not so much as a subject matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that it's, while, I'm, while I've defended progress in philosophy, I don't think all is well in our discipline. <laughs> Okay. Um, partly because, as I say, I'm interested in it. Uh, the, the thesis about progress I'm interested in is a kind of epistemological thesis, but it's that's nothing to do with the the discipline itself. And I do think it's a somewhat, you know, somewhat exclusionary discipline, somewhat unwelcoming discipline for people getting into it or wanting to get into it. That's not just because, as a lot of people have pointed out, it's, you know, very focused on kind of European thinkers and male thinkers and so forth. Not, not just for that reason, but even, even with it, that, though that is all true, I think, mostly. Um, uh, I also think that even within the areas that, you know, the areas that uh, they're sometimes called mainstream or core philosophy or something. Those, all of those words are problematic to some degree, but <laughs> if we just think of those, those areas, it's not as if those areas are monolithic. I mean, on the, on the contrary, they, they tend to be sort of full of, you know, riven by factions and uh, 
and there's a lot of fiefdoms and you know, <laughs> people work in certain areas and there's a tendency it's not it's not a universal tendency but there's a sort of tendency to for people to you know to to want to work on their areas and not only that but they sort of extremely dismissive about other 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 people who work on different areas and mm you know, to, don't, don't just sort of emphasize what they, what they do themselves, but emphasize negatively that other things are somehow, you know, crazy or ridiculous or, you know, unfounded. It's a very common thing for people to do that. And I think it's probably very difficult to get into a field if you do that, because you talk to one person and they sort of, you know, they talk about their topics and that's fine. But then if you ask them about something else, they say, ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, we've all had experiences like that. And no. I, I think it's, and especially for people, sort of students getting into the field, I think it can be extremely bewildering and kind of upsetting that this happens. Um, so I guess what I would do is, I mean, wh wh one of the things I was trying to do in the case of thinking about progress in philosophy is to think of philosophy as, is a just as an, or, an ordinary kind of subject, not a kind of peculiar subject, as Wittgenstein said, which is means that it's a really strange subject for which normal epistemic standards don't apply. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true about it at all. I do think it's somewhat peculiar socially, <laughs> <laughs> uh, culturally, and uh. I guess I would think it would be good if we could be somewhat more cosmopolitan in our general attitude and uh, it's fine to work on whatever areas you'd like to work on, but mm. you don't need to poo poo other people and encourage students to poo poo other people and so forth. So I think if we could be, as I say, more cosmopolitan uh, in our culture, that would be very good for attracting people and getting them into the subject uh, better than we've certainly done in the past. Okay, is the career worth it? Getting into philosophy, is it worth it? Oh yeah, the career is definitely worth it. It's a marvelous career. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard, to, it's now very difficult to get into it. And of course, any, um, you know, I, uh, one of the jobs I have here in philosophy at ANU is uh, to run the honors program, which is the senior undergraduate mm -hmm. program. And so students at that level are, are beginning to think about whether they should go off and do a PhD or not. And often, you know, if you've started to, as you know, if you've started to do a PhD in philosophy, then you're sort of on the roller coaster that inevitably tries to get you into an academic job, just the way things go. That sort of seems to be what, not, not all students, of course, but many, many students are like that. And most, most graduate programs are sort of geared for that. Mm -hmm. So that the honor students are sort of looking at this, wondering whether it's for them. And I always try to say that um, it's a wonderful thing to do and they should do it, but they also should have their eyes open as to what the, you know, what, what, the, what the problems are, what the possibilities are and uh, all that. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. And I'm always, uh, well, you know, amazingly thankful that I get a salary for doing it. When I first got a salary for doing it, I couldn't quite believe it. I was sitting <laughs> in my office thinking it's unbelievable. <laughs> but there it is. Yeah. Okay. So on that note, thanks again, Dan, for sharing your time with us and your thoughts. So join me again. Okay. Join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we talk about things that matter from a philosophical point. See ya. Thank you. Thanks very much.